started here. Uh, my name is Dennis Barber with the, um, the Partnership for Male Youth. Um, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us this afternoon. We will be, um, first of all, the session is being recorded, so it will be available after the fact. Um, we're going to be taking questions later. We're going to have uh, five, six presenters, and then we'll, we'll turn to Q&A and we'll open up the lines. Right now the lines are all muted. Um, but we're, we're see you can send, um, if you have a, a, a question or something, you can send on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see a, a chat, um, well, there's a, there's a chat um, section that, um, that you can send a message in. Um, also online, you will be able to download, we have the, um, the presentations, the slide presentations of the presenters, and there's a list of uh, the presenters and their, their bios that's, that's up there as well, and um, also another uh, PowerPoint about the program. So um, I'm going to walk you through the website in a second, but just to give you some, some background, um, we the fact of the matter is, is that from the time that adolescent males leave their pediatrician's office to the time they're probably in their mid-30s or 40s when they have a crisis, they, don't, they really don't seek out health care, and they don't receive it as a result. Um, which differentiates them from females of that age because they they see a gynecologist at least for um, contraception and they, the gynecologist essentially becomes their, their gatekeeper for health care. So some work has been done in this area in terms of sexual reproductive health. Dr. Bell and some others have done some work in this area and there's been some literature on it and some research on it and we started with that as a, a foundation and we worked out from there and decided that we were going to try to take a comprehensive approach to bring bring together all the information that was out there, the research that had been done in a range of areas so that we covered as many as we possibly could. Um, that's how we got to the toolkit. The, um, in terms of where we go from here, or in terms of how we got to the toolkit, we not only did an extensive literature search, but we interviewed over 100 people. And these were um, medical experts, uh, uh, national organizations, health-related organizations, and so on, to get a sense of whether or not they thought that this program would be of value and whether they thought we should proceed with it. And the consensus was that this is something that was needed, and um, had, they had all agreed that it had, had not been done. Um, finally, we want comment on this. We, this is a dynamic process. The website is going to be changing daily as research comes in as, and as people make suggestions. So please feel free to send in your comments, any suggestions for changes. Um, so finally, before I go to the site, we are planning to follow up with a patient and a parent a version of this, um, and that will be forthcoming in, um, in the next few months. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the website. Um, uh, Vic and um, David, can you see it? Vic, David? No, not on. Can you see it? No. no. Okay, right. The, web, the website's not on the page yet. It's still just all of us. Okay. There you go. Okay. Is it, is it up now? Now it is, yes. Okay. Basically, there are four components to, to the tutorial. A checklist, uh, uh, suggested questions for patients, um, supporting materials, and these are the, the, the references, as well as uh, guidelines and tools that have been developed by other organizations uh, relating to adolescent and young adult males. And then finally, a video library of CME and patient education material. How this is broken out is that there are nine, a total of nine health domains between health history and screening and physical exam and labs. And you can see them here on the right-hand side. Uh, these were chosen because we found that most of the, uh, the research had been done and the information that was available to justify recommendations were in these areas. If you go to any one of these areas, you'll see, for example, in sexual reproductive health, there are a number of sub-areas, um, sexual, sexual development and maturity, sanitation, gender, HIV, and so on. Each one of these, um, each, each, each one of these, uh, these areas um, have sub-areas in them. So, and as I said, each one of these has not only um, 
uh, questions for patients, but it has um, other tools and resources that have been developed by others in, in references. Um, and across the top, you can get information on the background, the video library, so on and so forth. Um, the video library, just to give you a sense of that, um, it's broken up into the same areas that the checklist is and the questions are. So those are the four components of the, of the toolkit right now. And um, as I said, we're going to be adding uh, further um, further components as, as uh, we go forward. So from there, I'm going to move on to our speakers. And the, the first is Dr. Art Esther, Arthur Esther. Um, Dr. Esther was instrumental in developing the American Medical Association's guidelines for preventive services. He is now an adjunct professor at the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine, where he teaches in the Masters of Public Health Program, and at the Loyola Chicago School of Law, where he teaches in the Masters of Jurisprudence Program. And I'm just going to pull up There we go. Okay, Art, take it away. Yep, yep, yep. Good afternoon, folks. Um, uh, while working with the American Medical Association, became impressed, me and my colleagues, that while we may, uh, well, we paid an awful lot of attention to various issues faced by adolescents, that there really was not much of a discussion about a comprehensive way to address these issues within a, a healthcare setting became a big believer that rather than focusing on, again, a single tailored categorical issue such as sexual reproductive health or violence or smoking or alcohol and drug abuse, that it was better to lay out for providers the whole panoply of preventive services and aid them in how to assess the teenagers who they saw to be able to address the particular issues that those teenagers might have faced. So we spent oh, probably over 10 years developing and implementing and studying the implementation of adolescent preventive services. Sort of the key issues here, the key concepts that we worked with was that, uh, to develop a comprehensive, scientifically justifiable recommendations for services that targeted youth 11 to 21. We came up, uh, we worked with an interdisciplinary panel of people recommended by national organizations, medical and non-medical, including nursing, and social work, nutrition. And we came up with 24 recommendations that addressed four categorical types of services. The manner in which health services are provided to teenagers. And I'll give away the end of my story. I think that this becomes extremely critical and one of the reasons I'm very excited about the toolkit, which is developed for this particular project, is that I think that the way that services are delivered uh, and helping systems and people sort of integrate these services really is very, very important. We had recommendations on health guidance for adolescents and their parents, screening to identify various issues, and immunizations. Um, we felt at that time, now this is oh goodness, 18 years ago or so, it seems like forever, represented a, a really a major shift in the delivery of health care to teenagers and that health guidance screening and immunizations um, would become central and not merely peripheral to routine health care. We also uh, played attention, as I said previously, to um, focusing on a, this comprehensive package rather than targeting isolated categorical issues. Um, our expectations for developing our guidelines for adolescent preventive services is we expected to improve the quality of care for youth, to change the focus of health services from curative to preventive medicine, to organize the content and delivery of these services, reduce health care expenses, and improve research capabilities. Our vision, and again, I would suggest that this is a vision for any of us who are dealing with, uh, with, with, with youth and including this particular project, is that how do we have a regular schedule of clinical preventive services that become institutionalized for youth 
uh, similar to the way that well child visits are institutionalized for infants. So it, again, it always struck us that, that we put all this emphasis on sort of zero to five or so, uh, but really there's relatively little, there was relatively little emphasis on sort of the packages of services that young people need uh, when they enter adolescence and going into the, the young adult years. Uh, we had uh, experiences implementing and studying uh, implementation in various health systems, including school-based health clinics, uh, HMO clinics, um, um, pr private practice systems, uh, and from that, I, in community-based clinics, and from that, we really learned, I think, quite a big deal, uh, and learned that it's critical to focus on engaging the system change when integrating preventive services, um, that we have to have champions, champions within that system. It usually, at least in the systems we work with, had to be a physician, but that physician could indeed allocate and, and distribute the, 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 the authority, if you will, to others. But there had to be someone who said, I want to do this. And to do this, you had to really focus on all the people involved in the system, whether it's the front desk people, whether it's the, the nurses, the doctors, whomever it was, that again, it's this issue of integration. And probably most important of all is this concept that one size does not fit all. So that we, we initially, in our first pilot project, said, okay, gee, here's this package of preventive services. You need to adhere to that um, to make it work. But we learned quickly that that was not the case, that each particular system that you work with is different. The culture is different. The ethos is different. The people have different belief systems, that, that they look at science differently, if you will, so that we, we learn very quickly that it's important for people to take these guidelines and to adapt them to meet their own uh, particular needs. So we provided technical assistance and we worked with them as they did that. Now, this doesn't come quickly. Some systems were up and running uh, and, and, and adapted within six to nine months. Some were a couple of years. So we felt, or I felt at least, that I think that this, the adolescent and young adult male services are a neglected component of clinical care. We, the Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the family physicians, all the different groups who have worked on adolescent services tend to look at it across the board. Nobody has really looked and said, are there specific needs of adolescent males? And I think that that's what is exciting about this particular project. Um, that, again, while the focus on young adult males is unique, and it's not addressed by GAPS or the other preventive service programs. And I think that, uh, in conclusion, that this, the Health Professional Toolkit provides sort of the essential guidance and supported material essential for integrating these services into routine care. So I'm going to stop there. Obviously, there's a, a lot of material that I sort of skimmed over and will be available for any questions later on uh, if we have time. Thank you. Thanks, Art. Um, I One thing I neglected before to do was to define uh, adolescent and young adult male. And uh, for the purposes of this, of this project, that's from ages 10 to 26. Our next speaker is Dr. David Bell. He is currently Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Population and Family Health in the Department of Pediatrics and in the Department of Population and Family Health at Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Bell is currently the Medical Director of the Family Planning Practice, and since 1999, he has been Medical Director of the Young Men's Clinic, a unique adjunct to New York Presbyterian Hospital's Family Planning Clinic. In that capacity, he delivers primary care to adolescent and young adult males with a focus on sexual and reproductive health. Dr. Bell is a strong advocate for the rights of young men to have access to respectful services that address health disparities associated with health care and sexual and reproductive health. David? Hi. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so a couple of people seem to be having some trouble hearing on the piece, their, their audio. Um, I guess one way also is to switch to a phone line if possible, if, if you're having trouble that you can't figure out. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Dennis, for the introduction. In the mid-1990s during my fellowship, I realized that our adolescent and young adult services were primarily geared toward females for many important reasons. But I also realized that we were not strategically addressing in a comprehensive way the health needs of adolescent and young adult males. 
During my fellowship, our head nurse in our clinic remarked, you, your guys are here to see you. And when I asked her to explain or comment, she remarked that I tended to have a larger showing of male patients than many of my other fellows. With that in mind, I started reflecting and noticing what, if anything, I might be doing differently. What I realized was is that I wasn't doing anything different than I was doing with my female patients. I was talking to them about their overall health and their relationships and their sexual and reproductive health. As Dennis said, I'm, I've been the medical director of the Young Men's Clinic since 1999, and the Young Men's Clinic was founded by Dr. Bruce Armstrong in the late, late 80s, who had and continues to have a vision for engaging young men in respectful healthcare services. The Young Men's Clinic is a unique adjunct to our family planning clinic that serves young men ages 14 to 35 for primary care with a focus on sexual and reproductive health. I'm proud to say that we have experienced many successes over the last decade. We have grown from one session a week to a full week, uh, full week's worth of sessions. In tandem, we have grown from uh, around 750 unique patients a year uh, to seeing just over 3,400 unique patients a year. So over the years, it's been, it is my hypothesis by, that by engaging young men in conversations about their relationships and their sexual and reproductive health, one can make strong connections. For many of my young men, I am probably the only person that they can have honest and frank discussions and about their worries and concerns without judgment. Over a decade, I'm continually reminded of how often adolescent and young adult males are enthusiastic to learn and engage in respectful conversations about their sexual and reproductive health and eager to have a greater understanding of their bodies and to know that all is healthy. As there are no specific guidelines for involving males in sexual and reproductive health services, many providers are not clear about what could be done for or with and with males regarding their sexual and reproductive health. Today's launch of the first section, the sexual and reproductive health section uh, of the toolkit, is an opportunity for coordinated approaches across all provider disciplines um, to address the sexual and reproductive health needs of adolescent and young adult males in the medical visit. Based on expert opinion, the toolkit is a framework and checklist of topics and, co and components that are optimally addressed, that could be optimally addressed during a healthcare visit. It is my hope that with the launch of this segment and future segments of the toolkit, we will influence greater engagement of adolescent and young adult males in medical homes and influence improvements in the current states of their health and also influence their future health positively. Thank you. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is uh, Judy Siegel. Uh, she is a social worker and director of mental health services at the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Her interest in the treatment of adolescent boys and young men began when she was in college and volunteered with the Juvenile Justice Diversion Program. In that experience, she observed the difficulty that young men have articulating feelings. She has worked in a variety of clinical mental health settings, including inpatient, college counseling, and private practice. She has a particular interest in the communication between provider and patient and seeks to help improve communication skills on both sides. And Judy, I'm going to pull up your presentation. Okay. Here we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, but I'm not, aha. I can't advance it. So, Dennis, can you help me with that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, after age 15, uh, males don't access medical care at the same rate as females. And this trend continues into adulthood. Next slide. Um, according to the CDC, the top three causes of death are uh, um, top three causes of death in AYA males is unintentional accidents, homicide, and suicide. 
males are three times more likely to die of unintentional injury than females, 6.7 times more likely to die of homicide than females, and four to five times more likely to die by suicide. Um, these, um, we've seen that these statistics, in statistics that females have a higher rate of depression and suicide attempts, and all we can really say is that more females report symptoms that are consistent with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. These statistics make it imperative to try to reach young adult males, adolescent young adult males. Next slide. Um, so here at Boston Children's Hospital, we ran a series of focus groups consisting of racial, racially and culturally diverse males, age 15 to 22. They articulated an aversion to going to the doctor, and as one young man put it, I would have to be on my deathbed before I would go to the doctor. Many of them expressed a preference for looking up medical information online. They find information and then they scare themselves to death. In um, 2008, we launched a website, www.youngmenshealthsite.org, to provide accurate, up-to-date health information to AYA males. The website was vetted by adolescent young adult males from design to content. It provides information on general health, sexual health, fitness and nutrition, and emotional health. There are parent guides on topics such as ADHD, Gardasil, and depression. The health guides are generally short and bulleted, as boys indicated that they prefer this. Um, it makes them easy to read and also easy for medical providers and educators to download and give them uh, to the young males to take home. Um, the next slide is a screenshot of the website. Uh, maybe some of you, for instance, not a re it's not not real big, so it's a little bit hard to see. But um, on the uh, menu on the left, there's also a link to our girls' website. Um, this is what the website looks like, and since we know that males have a hard time raising sensitive issues with their providers, we also included a feature in most of the guides that suggests ways to bring up that topic at a medical appointment. Fairly easy to navigate, and I hope you'll take a look at it and um, browse around and you know, use it. <clears throat> Next slide. When males do come to medical and mental health appointments, they often don't talk about what troubles them. Many feel vulnerable talking about their concerns in a culture that does not easily tolerate vul vulnerability in males, hence we get what's called the uh, mask, um, where boys look like they're saying something but uh, just presenting a good picture. Um, the focus groups told us clearly that young men want to be able to talk with their providers. The approach of the provider is key to being able to talk. Some of the disparity in healthcare utilization between genders may be attributed to lack of male-oriented interview skills of providers. One of our former fellows told us the way I was taught to interview is to ask all the questions, and if they say no or okay, then to move on. A gap in training is how to interact effectively with young men to get otherwise untalkative guys to share in ways that might not come naturally. Next slide. Here's what we learned from the focus groups. Adolescent and young adult males are extremely sensitive to body language, the amount of, genu of genuine interest shown, the way things are worded, and the presentation of the provider. They want to be greeted warmly. As one young man said, a handshake and a smile go a long way. They want the provider um, to remember them from one appointment to the next, and um, they want someone who begins appointments by creating a bond with them around their interests and activities. They like a professional but not stiff presentation. They want their providers to speak to them in plain but not blunt language. They don't much like a checklist approach, and they didn't like it when the provider types on the computer, especially if they don't explain to them first what they're doing. And they are extremely concerned about confidentiality. Next slide. Um, so using the feedback from the focus groups, we made a series of video vignettes uh, showing medical and mental health providers interviewing boys with a number of positive and negative interventions. The trainees or participants are encouraged to identify what works and what doesn't based on their observations and the feedback from the focus group information. Trainees are encouraged through the videos to sharpen their observation skills and ability to read nonverbal signs and also identify what verbal communication works well, gets desired responses. 
There are attachments in the training module, which is called Effective Clinical Interviewing of Adolescent Boys and Young Men, it's the title at the top of the slide. Um, and uh, we have an attachment, for instance, um, like the HEADS assessment that's tweaked or sort of revised to better fit the needs of adolescent young adult males. We recommend, for instance, that the interviews start with uh, bonding questions about interests and activities and then move to more difficult areas. Also, the assessment should include inquiry about anxiety and anger, which are um, prevalent modes of expression uh, of um, depression in young men. Um, next slide. So this material, along with the facilitator guide, is a very detailed guide with a breakdown of each um, uh, each video vignette um, with all the things that you should find in there as well as how to conduct a training session on this and it can be viewed on pdcases.org under resources and links so if you click on resources and links it comes right up at the top of the page also there are hard copies of the DVD and if anybody wants that you can email me at my email address below um, and the materials will also be posted on this toolkit site um, further, the checklist in this toolkit will guide providers about areas to cover and specifically how to ask young men about important health issues. So I will stop there. Okay, thank you, Judy. Yep. And again, um, these materials are available uh, through the links on the uh, left-hand side of your screen. Our next presenter is Dr. Victor Schwartz. Um, he is medical director at the Jed Foundation and a clinical associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at NYU School of Medicine. Dr. Schwartz has worked in college student mental health and university administration for over 20 years. He has been medical director and director of college mental health services and was university dean of students overseeing student services at a university based in New York for seven years. He was a member of the American Psychiatric Association's Presidential Task Force on College Mental Health and co-chaired the APA's Working Group on College Mental Health and the Law. Dr. Schwartz has written and lectured widely on college and young adult mental health and was co-editor of the text, Mental Health Care in the College Community, published by Wiley in 2010. Vic? Thanks, Dennis. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Sorry, uh, I'm getting over a bit of a cold. Uh, I just wanted to expand on a couple of comments that Judy made, but first, uh, just to let everyone know, the Jed Foundation is a nonprofit charitable organization that focuses on promoting mental health and preventing suicide in the college and university age population. Uh, recently, we've actually begun working more directly in the substance abuse prevention area as well as part of a partnership with the Clinton Foundation, uh, which we've just established. Uh, so what, what we try to do at the Jed Foundation is actually use a, a public health model uh, that's based on four uh, very broad principles. First is enhancing protective factors uh, and resilience. The second is early identification of young people with problems, which I think is very relevant to the work that uh, Dennis is doing with, uh, with the Partnership for Male Health. The third is focusing on providing clinical care, and the fourth is making sure that uh, focus on environmental safety and means restriction. But to go back uh, for a moment to this issue of early identification of problems, um, Judy mentioned before that the rate of suicide among men is about four times that of women. This is true in the college population, in non-college attending late adolescents and young adults as well, uh, although suicide attempts are significantly more common uh, in young women and in women in general. Uh, what's interesting is that there has long been the notion that uh, depression is more common uh, in young women and young men. Uh, there's been some recent literature uh, about um, the challenge of diagnosing depression in young men. I think in some ways it's akin to some of the challenges we've had with cardiovascular disease in women. Uh, we tend not to know what to look for. Uh, and in fact, when you fold in issues such as irritability, uh, conduct issues, and substance misuse as indicators of possible depression, uh, and then explore a little bit more carefully, we really begin to see that the rates of depression in, in young men and young women are, are just about equal. 
Uh, again, the challenge here is that they tend to act, men tend to act more impulsively. Uh, they tend to, uh, in the context of suicide, use more lethal means, uh, which some people believe is, is part of the reason and part of what accounts for the higher rates of suicide. Women, uh, young women tend to take overdoses, which are actually rarely fatal, uh, while young men tend to use more aggressive and, and violent means like shooting or jumping. Um, we also know, as, as Judy suggested, that young men are very, very reticent to come for help. And uh, as a result of that, it's really urgent, and, and I think this is, uh, again, why the uh, toolkit is a really valuable contribution, to begin to get primary care clinicians, uh, uh, the pediatricians and primary care people working with younger people, folding in these concerns uh, and paying attention to the emotional needs, substance abuse challenges, which often, again, uh, young people are very, very loath to discuss. Uh, we know very well as well that uh, eating disorders, although rarer in young men, are also very rarely uh, talked about without really careful evaluation and probing. And again, this very common problems of anxiety and depression are often not addressed at length. So being provided with a framework and, and some active tools through this toolkit uh, to really begin to address and, and discuss these issues with young people in a way that, you know, based on the experience of, of a lot of us, has been most productive, I think, is, is a really important and valuable step forward. So uh, I, I applaud your effort in uh, pulling all this together, Dennis, and I'll stop there. Okay. Um, I don't know whether we have some technical difficulties with Dr. Pellman. Uh, Rich, can you, I know you can hear us, um, are you able to, no, unfortunately not. I'm going to try to, um, try to figure that out at this end. I'm sorry about that. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to go to um, questions. If you could please mute your phones, which I quite clearly didn't do myself, um, that would be helpful. And um, I'll just open it up for a discussion here. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. Okay, uh, what you can do is you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. It is in um, the question mode right now. Um, uh, does somebody want to jump in? Also, by the way, at the um, top of the screen, you'll see my mood. Um, there is a selection there for raising your hand. If you raise your hand, then we'll know that you have a question you want to ask. So does somebody want to get started? And Dennis, there is a question someone typed in from Orlando, uh, so people can actually type in questions as well on the left on the left hand column. Right. If anybody's trying to ask a question and you're having problems with that, if you could just send us a, a message. Uh, again, you have to um, Dennis, two people have Hello, this is Sharon Amichetti. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I do have a question. It, you know, it hadn't really occurred to me that young women do regularly have face time with a medical professional because of their um, going to their gynecologists on a regular recurring basis. Um, but so young men don't have the face time with health professionals in the same way in a um, occurrence that would just be a natural part of their regular receipt of care. So how do we either increase um, paraprofessionals or health professionals uh, 
uh, exposure to the younger males and so that they do have opportunity to address some of those issues that they would rather not perhaps address as that one young man expressed on that focus group that he would rather be on his deathbed than go to a health professional. I thought that was pretty profound. So I'd just be interested to hear what the what the uh, presenter's thoughts are about that. Thank you. Good goodness, I'll, I'll take that. If, um, so yes, most of our uh, guidelines really sort of speak to us engaging young m women particularly in sexual and reproductive health services. And it'll, it will be interesting over time what our changes in pap smear guidelines will, how that will mediate sort of the visits for adolescent and young, particularly adolescent females to the, the gynecologist or possibly to sexual and reproductive health services uh, during that period of time. However, um, there are opportunities that we aren't as a whole taking advantage of. So young men in particular, are, and this is not, uh, this is a subset of young men, but young men that are entering the workforce that uh, need sports physicals, that um, need some type of um, entree for, for physicals for, for the primary care, primary care provider, we can use that opportunity to engage them in sort of broader health topics and in particular sexual and reproductive health topics. And that's sort of been the sort of uh, gateway that we've used in the Young Men's Clinic. We work with uh, coaches uh, at schools that will send kids for sports physicals. Uh, we are very well known for doing uh, work physicals and sports physicals overall and school physicals. And those are the avenues that we use and sort of the opportunities that we use to engage our young men in those conversations. Uh, this is Art Elster. Uh, one other piece, in addition to what uh, Dr. Bell was talking about, is the uh, large number of, of young males who have sort of ongoing chronic health conditions, whether it's hypertension, whether it's overweight or obesity, um, whether it's asthma, that again, that they're, they're coming into the system, but it's not um, usually looked at that we take those opportunities to uh, talk with them about a broad array of other health issues that are concerns that they may have. I also I wanted to just uh, point out that somebody had um, texted a question or written in a question about um, um, coaches and is there anything that coaches can, you know, is there any material for coaches? And I think coaches are, you know, wonderful entree into um, health care. They, they see, and trainers, um, athletic trainers in high schools and um, colleges, they see these guys and they, um, if they can be educated about the materials that are out there, they can be a conduit for young men. And, and Judy, just to add to that, the uh, National Athletic Trainers Association, uh, along with the NCAA, ha have uh, recently put out a mental health toolkit uh, to help trainers and coaches, at least at the college level. I think that they were planning to reach out uh, to, to some of their contacts at the high school level as well. Uh, so uh, there is actually a new medical director at the NCAA who uh, is really serious, I think, about addressing the general health needs of, uh, of young men and women that uh, are involved in athletics at colleges. That, um, th that is one of the, the, the questions we have to face. I've said that we can develop all of the recommendations possible for what kind of services that AYA males should be getting, but then we need to figure out where are they interfacing with the healthcare system. Um, and to, to, in, to increase access, we have to increase their, their uh, interaction with the healthcare system. And that's, you know, that's probably one of the greatest challenges. There was a question that was asked about um, testicular issues, and um, Dr. Pellman, who, who is not on live, but just uh, texted me, the answer to the question um, about testes is yes, it is addressed, and we hope to have more on, on testes self-exam for AYA population to access. Uh, Shelley asked, a, typed in a question about time constraints by providers, um, and does the toolkit address that? I, I think that that really is the uh, a, a extremely critical question. 
the toolkit itself takes the position that if you've talked with youth and young males and if you have identified the need that you can use this information to drill down further, um, I think that, um, again, I, I focus on health systems and the need for the system to look at how one does some kind of a general assessment for the youth but so by the time that they get into seeing the private provider who has much more limited time, that that provider has a better understanding of what to, to focus on. So what we did with our GAPS project is we had a very simple questionnaire that the kids would fill out in their uh, waiting room and that that would help to uh, lead the provider in their, um, in their clinical interview. Uh, I don't think that these types of tools are diagnostic assessment tools, but I think that they can help the provider to understand that this is a, a green light issue that may not need further attention, or this is a yellow or red light issue for which the provider needs to spend more time. And if we I could did, well, go ahead. While doing a, a broad screening, you know, obviously takes a bit more time up front. You know, the the hope that we try to look towards on the mental health side at least is that uh, you actually get to the young person before they're on their uh, proverbial deathbed as, as commented by that student in, in Judy's presentation that in fact spending a little bit more time up front hopefully gets you to uh, prevent and avoid more really bad uh, and crisis situations which obviously, you know, dealing with those, they may be someone else's problem. They may, may wind up being emergency room problems. But in fact, in terms of the system as a whole, they wind up eating up a, a tremendous amount more time and resources. One of our providers sort of takes the tactic that the first appointment is really a relationship building appointment, that he's not going to be able to <clears throat> go through every item uh, that the insurance company wants him to, and that's, you know, what a follow-up appointment is for. But he really attempts to engage the young man uh, and build a relationship, which helps uh, down the road in taking care of him and helping him um, take care of himself. I would definitely support that position. You may ask a, many questions, but the first appointment, particularly uh, first, is really about um, relationship and sort of engaging them for the future. There, um, there was a question here about the the issue of uh, a checklist and typing into computers and the fact that um, the kids don't like that. One of the things that we're we're hoping to look into with the with the, the, the patient follow-up projects is methods for getting information from patients that are user-friendly. There has been limited research in this area, but one of the, one of the options would be to have the, um, the patient fill out something electronically on his iPad or what have you. And then there will be a screening procedure after that um, to whittle it down so that when, when he gets to the healthcare provider, um, they've been able to identify what the major problems are. The other other thing I wanted to mention was um, in the toolkit, we have two things. One is the key points in each section. These are the most important points for, for folks not to miss if they don't read anything more in that section. There are also the questions that are suggested for patients, <clears throat> the ones that are the most important, that the, the group felt were most important are in bold, um, and there's a notation to that. Are there any other um, <clears throat> any other questions from the participants besides the? Um... There have been several dentists that have been typed in on the uh, chat comments. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Um, <clears throat> Oh, that's interesting. Um, that, do one of you want to take that? The uh, uh, female healthcare providers um, interacted with males. Judy, you could you should be able to address that. Yes, so and that's sorry. actually it's very interesting because we did ask the boys, do they prefer um, male or female providers? Because I think that um, people have an intuitive sense that male providers uh, are are preferable to to boys, and that is actually not the case. 
Um, it's just all over the map. There were boys that said, I want a male medical provider, but I really want to, if it's mental health, I want to talk to a woman. There are others who said, I want a female medical provider because I don't want a guy touching me. But I think, you know, to talk to a counselor, they would understand me better. Um, and I think the um, research supports that, that there's no real consistent um, a preference by young males. A good provider. That's really what I recommend. I would I would add to that they from the from the research out there is uh really supports that they want someone comfortable working with them, someone honest that engages them in a genuine nature. And it really the the gender of the provider is irrelevant. There's a question here about um is there any research evaluation being done with the toolkit? That raises another issue, as similar to the one I, I, I mentioned before, about you can provide the even provide the well, you can provide the recommendations, but then you have to, to figure out ways of delivering the care. Um, one of the things that we're hoping will come of this in the long term is development of a research agenda for adolescent and young adult male health care, because that was one of the things that we found in putting this together that there clearly are gaps. And um, in the in the long term, as we do further work on this, we'll be able to identify a, a research agenda. The areas that, that need to be um, given more attention. So there's one question about how much are we factoring in the prospect of masculinity as a predictor variable in compliance to these programs offered. Um, it's been my experience, um, more than sort of a research experience, that yes, uh, from the research it says that masculinity, or at least hegemonic masculinity, factors and variables that a per individual might buy into may be hindrances for them uh, connecting to healthcare services. Practically, however, I would say that most of the sort of facade of sort of the hegemonic masculinities, if they step in across the threshold for whatever reason, and if you provide the space that's open and connecting and genuine, no matter what facade they have outside, they actually drop that facade to actually have great conversations, discuss their emotions, discuss their health care concerns in, in the office with their provider. Um, uh, strategies. Is, it, uh, is there a resource that compiles good outreach strategies that target young men? David, do you want to comment on that? Uh, so it's interesting that, especially in the Title X family planning uh, world, there's been a lot of work on sort of outreach to males. And um, particularly my colleague, Dr. Armstrong, has been doing a lot of outreach in specific ways to the group of adolescent and young adults that we are trying to engage in healthcare. And in particular, we're trying to uh, outreach to young men in workforce development programs, getting their GED, trying to enter the workforce. We're uh, trying to uh, get young men, particularly um, re-entering from incarceration. Uh, we are also looking to uh, engage young men in college campuses. So we have a, a variety of different uh, strategies uh, for each one, some of work, which are working with community-based organizations and educating their staff. We work with coaches in high schools and sort of educate them about our services and what we um, what we offer. And then we also uh, have an ambassador program, in a sense, for community colleges, where we have uh, at least two to three young men from each community college work with us. Uh, we have workshops for them. We talk with them uh, to engage young men on campuses around healthcare discussions, and also uh, tell tell their uh, other students about our services to engage in healthcare. Dr. Pellman has asked me to to underscore the fact that uh, the next stage to this project will involve developing um, similar. Uh, resources for patients and for parents. Much of the information that is in the toolkit 
can be easily adapted for parents uh, and patients themselves. As a matter of fact, even the way that it is right now, there's a lot of valuable information in there. But we, we want to construct resources that are just tailored to parents and uh, caregivers and patients themselves. So I just want to respond to the masculinity component again. I agree that, yes, the, we, I did, and as many people do, we sort of really target the negative masculine sort of components, but there are positive uh, traits as well. And there are many um, broader programs that seek to connect to the more positive um, aspects of masculinity. And particularly one is called the Strength Campaign, uh, which is out of DC. And they speak about, it's my strength not to hurt. And so it's really about violence and relationship violence and sort of helping to relate to the strength um, trait, positive strength traits of masculinity in a way that engages them in uh, better and sort of healthier behavior. Yes, I also There's a question. Just wanted, I'm sorry, I just wanted to comment on um, the comment on the in the margin about what could be wrong with being strong, and uh, I think I lost it here now. Um, just uh, strong and courageous and uh, there were a couple of other things. And I think, of course, there's nothing wrong with that, but boys don't always feel that way and don't feel that they can um, let people know when they don't feel that way. So it isn't so much being strong, it's looking strong, and that's kind of what, what gets them uh, into some trouble sometimes. Right, Julia. The, the notion of being strong seems to contradict the notion of asking for help. So that's really where it runs you into difficulty. Uh, the the question about uh, race ethnicity ethnicity um, we we struggled with that and decided that although there there is some information in there that's specific to race and ethnicity that um, with this first iteration we're taking a broader brunch a, a broader brush rather and we're hoping to drill down in the future because there are all sorts of areas that are are quite quite different for different 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 groups. So that will be, again, something we'll be undertaking in the future. And I guess um, I guess that's it, unless there are any further questions. Anybody want to make a, a comment to close? Uh, I would just like to say that I'm really excited about the launching of this toolkit. I think it's going to be a great... Um, uh, tool for providers to be able to, um, you know, get started and kind of as a, a map, a road map um, on where to go with with young men. I think it's going to benefit boys greatly. And I want to thank all the presenters. All of them were heavily involved in creating this. As, um, in addition to a number of other people that really made this possible, it was very much a group effort, a group effort and um, I'm really thankful to everybody that participated. Mm -hmm. That that is uh, posted online, has been recorded, and please, please, please send in your comments, your suggestions for how this can be improved. Uh, we hope to engage more and more people as we move forward. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>